Right. Thank you very much um, for the for having me here, and I would like to especially thank the organizers of this meeting and congratulate them on this wonderful conference. So it has been a, a truly terrific experience for me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, loops in the sky um, and some recent, maybe non-orthodox applications of the amplitude methods in galaxy clustering and gravitational waves. Um, so uh, the structure of my talk will be very simple. In the first half, I will present some results uh, that have to do with the galaxy cluster and cosmology. And in the second half of my talk, I will uh, discuss um, applications of amplitudes to gravitational waves, specifically to uh, tidal effects that capture the finest size structure. All right. Um, so if it gets stuck so in the beginning, it? it should uh, work okay. now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, we've had we've uh, had some talks on cosmology before. Uh, let me just say that uh, uh, with the you know amount of observational data that we have, we have a very con coherent and consistent picture of our universe and its previous evolution. So we believe that uh, it all started with something like inflation. So, well, depicted here. So inflation was a primordial accelerated expansion of our universe that created the uh, primordial fluctuations that created the seeds for structure formation. And then after this uh, expansion, you know, the universe continued to expand without acceleration. And at some point it, you know, it was expanding and cooling down. At some point it cooled down up to the point that the first atoms were created. And the radiation left over from this epoch gave us the very first picture of our universe. Um, that we can observe through the uh, cosmic microwave background. And here you can see the um, cartoon of the uh, cosmic microwave background temperature map with some fluctuations that precisely trace this uh, inflationary fluctuations. And then later on, the same cosmological fluctuations, they you know, continue to grow, they collapsed, and they form galaxies that we get to observe in galaxy surveys. And um, you can see them here. And in, in um, you know, cosmology, we also have the standard model that is called the inflationary lambda CDM model um, that basically you know, just says that we can explain all the properties of these fluctuations that we see with very few ingredients. So we have to assume that something like inflation happened. We have to assume, well, that something like cold dark matter exists and also that um, there is a cosmological constant that is responsible for the late time accelerated expansion of the universe. And this picture is very powerful and simple, and yet it has many known unknowns. So things we know, we don't know. Uh, so we don't know what was inflation exactly. We don't know if dark matter is really cold. Um, and it would be good to understand this. And also, of course, we, um, well, we expect maybe to, we hope for some unknown unknowns. So things we don't know, we don't know. Uh, those are surprises in data. So something that will pop up and will totally destroy this uh, nice and coherent picture that we have. So in order to continue making progress on these questions, uh, we have to continue measuring fluctuations. And uh, that means that, well, after exploiting the CMB, now we, are, we have to move on to galaxies. And in cosmology, we have a very uh, precise definition of information. Uh, that would be the number of modes. And historically, well, here I'm showing you the number of modes as a function of year. Uh, historically, galaxy surveys, they have been the main source of cosmological information in the past. Well, up to the point, well, they offered us some learning curve that we used to you know, learn our universe. Uh, but at some point, we discovered the CMB, and the CMB offered us the, a mo much more steeper learning curve. And we have been exploiting this curve in the past uh, 20 years or so. And this is basically something that we used to establish the Lambda CDM model. Uh, but unfortunately, the amount of information contained in the CMB is limited by the fact that the CMB is a two-dimensional uh, plane. Uh, so basically, we cannot really move much further than that. And we have to go back to this more uh, sustainable learning curve. And this is what we're doing right now. And we already have some uh, great surveys going on, such as DESI and Euclid, that will match the amount of information uh, of Planck. And then we are discussing, of, we're discussing future surveys, such as Megamapper, uh, that will happen on a time scale of, let's say, 10 years, that will give us orders of magnitude more information. So as Nima uh, said yesterday at dinner, uh, there should be no mode left behind. And this program is exactly how we're going to get it. Uh, by, so at face value, this program will give you orders of magnitude more modes than the CMB. And of course, you know, this means that we'll have orders of magnitude better measurements of cosmological parameters. 
Um, and uh, this will mean, of course, a totally different ball game. So the problem is that the CMB is described by linear physics. So if I look at the CMB map, um, you know, CMB fluctuations is just a collection of cold and hot spots. And this map uh, represents a Gaussian random field. So if I calculate its correlation function, the power spectrum on the sky, then I can perfectly fit it with linear theory. Now with galaxies, the situation is different. So galaxies on large scales, they look a lot like the CMB, you know, over densities, under densities, more or less Gaussian, look a lot like the cold and hot spots. But then on small scales, uh, we'll start finding some, if we zoom in, we'll start finding some uh, filaments and clusters and a lot of nonlinear structure. And if I calculate the two-point function of galaxies and try to fit with linear theory on large scales, so small wave numbers is gonna fit, but on small scales is going to totally fail. And uh, this is because the nonlinearities and associated with them non-Gaussianity in the galaxy distribution. So those are very important facts that we need to describe. Um, so yeah, I've uh, described how challenging, what, what the challenge is. So let me also now explain what are the um, you know, cool things that we actually learn from galaxy distribution once we have solved this challenge. Uh, an example of that, which I believe would be close to the heart of this audience, would be a recent analysis of the cosmological collider model. So as uh, Hayden uh, presented uh, in his talk, we, you know, we in general expect some primordial non-Gaussianity during the inflation. And this primordial non-Gaussianity we can actually measure. And this is something that we can use to probe uh, the particle content, interactions, and the speed of propagation of different particles in the early universe. And uh, one example of such interaction, you can assume that you have a massive particle whose mass is greater than the Hubble during inflation, and then this particle decays. And this decay, so its decay is described by this um, Feynman diagram. Um, pi is the inflaton field. So this decay will generate a particular shape of the three-point correlations that we can measure in the galaxy distribution and derive constraints on this scenario, or you know, hopefully, maybe in future, even measure uh, such correlations. So we have. Um, derived the first ever constraints on this model, and we were able to, well, obtain some non-trivial constraints on the mass of this scalar particle, mu. Well, mu is basically the mass in, in the units of the Hubble during inflation, and this Hubble could be as high as 10 to the 14 GV. So this represents uh, one of the, um, you know, few tests of uh, particle of, you know, particles at uh, extremely high energies that we have. So, okay, we, you know, in future, we would like to uh, repeat these measurements with this data. Um, now, from the technical point of view, the um, challenge we're facing uh, is as follows. So we measure the three-point function of the galaxy uh, over density field that I defined here. Um, so in Fourier space, this would be a bispectrum. And this bispectrum has several contributions. And here I'm breaking these contributions down. Um, so I'm showing you some bispectrum uh, for the equilateral configuration as a function of weight numbers. And um, well, we want to measure this new physics signal in the bispectrum that I'm showing here. So this is our cosmological collider signal, if you will. And then you see that normally the amplitude of the signal is very small. Um, and first you have to worry about this uh, non-Gaussianities that are generated by the galaxy formation that I mentioned before. Um, and here I'm showing you these different contributions from the galaxy formation loops. Uh, that basically responds to our lambda CDM background. So we have three level contribution, one loop, two loop, et cetera. So basically the name of the game here is to calculate this uh, lambda CDM background due to galaxies as, uh, you know, as good as we can in order to be able to really measure this signal of new physics. Uh, to really, well, introduce properly what are these loops I'm talking about, uh, let's take a look at the simplest example that produces uh, loops in large scale structure. And this is the galaxy bias, um, or the relationship between the observed um, you know, um, galaxy field, observed galaxies, and the underlying dark matter field. So here in this uh, uh, cartoon, in this snapshot, I'm showing you the output of the simulation of, uh, with, uh, you know, for galaxy formation. And the gray structure here corresponds to dark matter that we actually don't get to see. And the yellow blobs are galaxies that sort of we get to see in an actual galaxy survey. And the first thing that jumps at you when you look at this picture is that the distribution of galaxies and dark matter uh, is correlated. And if you use uh, symmetries plus dimensional analysis and you try to capture this correlation, the first thing that you can write down is a linear relationship. And this is something that is called linear bias. Uh, 
Okay, this is something that just dictated is dictated by symmetries basically. Um, but then uh, you you know since everything is nonlinear, you have to write down also at some point higher order operators. The, the simplest one will be the um, matter field squared. So this is nonlinear bias, and this um, this operator basically tells you well it accounts for the fact that the distribution of uh, galaxies is more. Uh, has bigger contrast than the distribution of, of, of matter. So like if you see an over density of, of, of matter, there is an even bigger over, de over density of galaxies. Or if you see, um, if you take a look at this void in dark matter, you will see an even bigger void in the galaxy distribution. So th those effects are captured by um, uh, terms similar to this one. All right, so let's see how this uh, simple model produces loops. The ingredient that we're missing is the uh, statistical distribution. So let's assume that the matter field that appears here on the right hand side um, is a Gaussian random field, which is a good approximation, large scales. So all, all of its properties are captured by the two point function in Fourier space. So that will be this power spectrum. And everything is non relativistic. So it's, you know, the power spectrum is a function of the uh, three dimensional wave number. And this power spectrum, we can uh, calculate for a given cosmological model, and turns out that this is a very complicated function of the momentum. Um, so this is because the shape of the power spectrum depends on all the previous evolution of the universe, so it depends on the uh, radiation, baryons, neutrinos, dark matter, uh, and so on and so forth. And typically we, we do this, we calculate this using Boltzmann codes. So uh, we only know the shape, the momentum dependence of the propagator numerically. So now let me calculate the uh, galaxy power spectrum. So for that, I just have to take this expression, square it, and take the expectation value, okay? Uh, and the linear term will just produce, you know, a simple linear propagator times some uh, constant. So this term is trivial. Then I will find the three-point correlation, which is zero for a random Gaussian field. And then the first non-trivial contribution will come from this four-point function. So when I square this term, and in Fourier space, this will produce the following uh, loop integral over two uh, propagators. And this is basically the uh, type of loop integrals that we in general encounter in large scale structure theory. And you can assign some Feynman diagram that basically depicts this uh, integral and then um, go on and calculate you know, more loops and, and more complicated uh, effects. So here, obviously, I'm skipping a lot of details. Um, well, there is some literature. You can, you can go online and check, the, for instance, the uh, review that I wrote last year uh, on, this, uh, on this topic that contains all the relevant references. But the general picture is really that, that the simplest integral has this form. All right, let's see how we're going to, to, to evaluate this integral. So as I said before, uh, the linear power spectrum that appears here in this loop integral is something that we know only numerically. So the way how we deal with that is we actually approximate this integral, well, as well, this propagator we approximate as a collection of, of power loss. And the um, exponents of this power loss are in general complex. And the best way to think about this as a, a Fourier transform in, in the space of logarithm of k. And uh, hence this method is called FFT log. So logarithmic fast Fourier transform. So once you plug this expansion back in your loop integral, you are going to find this expression. And this is something that I'm sure uh, people in this community know from the kindergarten. This is one of the standard integrals that you can find in textbooks. Uh, so this is a, a three-dimensional massless uh, Euclidean QFT integral for general scaling dimensions. And you can do this integral and obtain the result in terms of the uh, gamma functions. So this seems like a very trivial, very simple result. Yet it's extremely powerful because you can actually show that all the integrals that appear at one loop uh, in the context of galaxy formation physics, they all have the same form. Uh, so uh, in the most general case, uh, we, we can you know, easily now evaluate all these integrals. And uh, I produce the code, class PT, that does this and calculates 150 loop integrals in one second, thanks to this analytic expression. And this is exactly the tool thanks, that we used before to uh, derive uh, you know, constraints on the cosmological collider and many other things. So we've, uh, you know, there was a lot of progress in cosmology thanks to this simple formula. So um, this bring, brings me to my next slide. Imagine how much progress we can make with a two-loop integrals. 
so the two loop integrals for large scale structure, they have the following, well, uh, Feynman representation. They correspond, they have the following Feynman diagrams. The most general loop integrand that appears there will look like this. It will look like a, a three dimensional massless Euclidean, well, two loop integral with a five, sort of five propagators with general scaling dimensions. Uh, there is a formal um, solution to this integral on the right hand side that you can express as an infinite series over hypergeometric functions, but unfortunately this uh, formula converges very slow, so it doesn't offer you any significant advantage as compared to the brute force numerical integration. And that's why new ideas uh, from the amplitude community, so from you, are very much welcome and, and appreciated. So now let me um, change the gears, switch the gears, and describe um, some recent applications of amplitudes for gravitational wave science. So we've already heard some uh, great talks uh, one by Zwiber and, and uh, also I'm looking forward to a talk by Alessandra after mine. So basically we were witnessing right now the precision of gravitational wave science and with experiments such as LIGA, um, uh, Kagra and Virgo, we have seen something like 50 black hole, uh, black hole mergers and the typical mergers that we see consists of uh, three phases. So it starts with an spiral phase, and then you know uh, we have the coalescence and the ring down. And these phases, we use well different technical tools to describe them, but also they are sensitive to different physics. For instance, this ring down phase uh, gives you a prop of black hole quasi-normals that have many fascinating properties. But on the other part of the spectrum, the spiral phase uh, gives you a prop of the tidal deformation of the sources. And which is actually super cool because the tidal deformations allow you to probe the internal structure of compact bodies. So in general, one can define two types of uh, tidal effects. So the typical problem that we're solving here is uh, we have two bodies that you know um, orbit each other and tidally perturb each other. So they produce uh, tidal force. And then in response to this tidal force, the bodies uh, develop some induced quadrupole moments, and the amplitude of those moments depends only on the internal structure of the bodies. And this amplitude is captured by the so-called uh, tidal loft numbers uh, that are a conservative effect. And the tidal loft numbers basically describe the, the, um, deform the induced deformation of the surface. Uh, on top of that, if the body has some sort of uh, you know, it's made of a fluid with some viscosity, or for instance, you know, if we're talking about a black hole, black hole um, has the horizon that absorbs things. So in this case, uh, if you have some absorptive uh, uh, property, well, if you have some, um, you know, something like viscosity, then you can actually convert the mechanical energy into heat. And a classical, you know, effect of this tidal heating is the uh, tidal locking. So we know that for the Earth Moon system, the Moon is tidally locked. So we can, we get to see only one side of the Moon. This is precisely because of the tidal heating. So those are the two effects that, that are sensitive to the internal structure of the bodies. And uh, in the post-Newtonian nomenclature, they correspond to different um, you know, uh, orders. So the tidal heating uh, appears first at four post-Newtonian orders, so it modifies the waveform uh, like this. And the five post-Newtonian order uh, corresponds to conservative flat numbers, and you, you see modifications here closer to the coalescence. Um, so these effects you can use to test the equation of state of neutron stars. Also, you can use these effects to uh, probe the nature of compact objects. So we believe that uh, what we see at LIGA are black holes, but maybe they are not. So the only way to, let's say, strictly speaking, test them is to try to measure these coefficients from the data, uh, as we have done recently with the uh, local group ATS, Horn Chen Chi, and Zihanjo. So as you can see, you know, these tidal effects are uh, super interesting. Uh, but let me now say how we actually define them, because, you know, I started the discussion with, um, you know, black hole coalescence. This is, you know, a very uh, nonlinear um, effect. So maybe the Newtonian thinking that I used before with the lot numbers is not good for this problem. So the way how we define lot numbers uh, consistently in JAR is uh, we use the Warland effective field theory by Goldberger and Rothstein. So the idea is that a black hole or neutral star or anything else you know, at very large distances, it will appear just a, as a point particle, and then we can uh, describe the departures from the point particle description by writing down uh, effective operators coupled to the word line, and the leading one will correspond to this uh, electric tidal field, which is basically the Riemann tensor properly contracted with the four velocity, so this is something that reduces to the usual tidal tensor in the Newtonian limit, 
so the local operators, they capture conservative dynamics, uh, and uh, there are some Wilson coefficients that appear here that basically correspond to lot numbers. Um, and if you want to describe the dissipative dynamics, you have to be a more, uh, well, you have to be smarter because the, you, know, you cannot do it with the local action. You have to uh, introduce some um, dissipative degrees of freedom that live on the, on the word line and then um, kind of put them in a composite operator, such as this uh, composite multiple moment, and then couple this internal multiple moment to the tidal fields. And uh, this kind of construction we, we use a lot in the context of the ADS CFT correspondence. And basically the two-point function of this Q field encodes the dissipative dynamics. So its imaginary part will, will, do, will encode tidal heating. So once we have this um, um, word line EFT, so what can we do with this? How can we use it to predict waveforms? So the idea typically is that we extract this Wilson coefficients from some marching calculations to JAR. And then we can use this action to produce the waveforms. Now it becomes predictive after the matching. And normally this matching is done at the level of the offshell quantities, such as the Newtonian potential. So after some back and forth, basically, you know, this offshore matching, you can show it works well at leading order. Uh, and we know that we all agree that the lot numbers for black holes, they vanish. But also the matching conditions are trivial at leading order. And uh, some complications appear at the next to lean order when we consider these operators the, that correspond to the dynamical loft numbers. And there is some confusion in, in the literature between different authors, well, including myself. And this is precisely because this, uh, uh, you know, the offshore matching is sensitive to gauge choice, is sensitive to, to coordinates. So these ambiguities is something that I'm going to use as a motivation for the alternative approach, that is to use the on-shell scattering amplitudes. Uh, and uh, for the matching to GR, and as everyone here in this audience knows, the on-shell amplitudes are great because they are free of gauge and coordinate dependence, and also they are not, they are invariant with respect to the field redefinition. And we have done this matching um, in, uh, well, in a collaboration with, uh, um, with uh, my fantastic collaborations, um, collaborators, Yuzhou uh, Li, Julio Paramartins, and Zihan Zhou, who are all here in this audience. So let me uh, present these results very quickly in a minute. Uh, so basically the idea is that we consider the gravitational analog of the Raman scattering. So we scatter massless fields of a black hole. You know, we can start with spin zero field, but also consider spin one or spin two fields. Uh, and then you can use this word line action to calculate the scattering uh, process in the EFT and compare to the known answers in JAR. Uh, so this calculation in general is quite complicated. So we started with a scalar example uh, so here you can see the scalar word line action. It's very similar to the one that I showed you before. And we carry out this calculation in the partial wave basis where basically each tidal operator corresponds to a particular partial wave and also where the, there is a very clear separation between dissipative and conservative effects. Dissipative effects, they change the inelasticity parameter and conservative effects, they affect the phase. Um, so the conceptual uh, problem with, with conceptual difficulty of these calculations, you have to separate uh, these tidal effects from the usual terms in the post-Minkowski um, um, expansion due to the nonlinearity of gravity. So the typical expression for the amplitude will take this form. You will have a lean order contribution, corresponds to three-level diagrams, plus you have some post-Minkowski corrections that stem from uh, the following, um, you know, multi-loop higher order diagrams. And you need to calculate all of that to be able to extract the tides. Uh, so for a scalar field, the tides appear at 3 p.m. order. So we have calculated these loops using the techniques that were presented before here at this conference. Uh, so let me just show you the final results. Um, so we've obtained this expression for the um, um, phase, for a scattering phase uh, in the post-Minkowski expansion. So we have some IR singularities due to the Weinberg phase. We have some IR logs. And we have some post Minkowski contributions. At some point, we have a divergence in the S wave that is precisely renormalized by the uh, um, dynamical loft numbers. We also calculated the elasticity parameters, and then we, you know, renormalized them. We obtained some non-trivial matching conditions, and we compared these results for black holes with uh, black hole perturbation theory answers. Uh, so that looked like this. Uh, you know, there are also many logs in this expansion, and it's not clear, you know, if these logs are IR or UV, but after the matching, we, you know, identified them quite nicely. So we showed that the static left numbers are zero and do not run, uh, you know, consistent with the off-shell calculations, and then dynamical left numbers are non-zero and, and they run, and we 
match them completely for the first time. And uh, well, the upshot of this discussion is that, you know, it seems that EFT works, the normalization works, everything is great. We can match, uh, you know, what numbers. We are now working on the gravitational example. We know that dynamic loft numbers for gravity are not zero. Uh, we extracted their RG running, it's universal. Um, it's the same for black holes and neutron stars. It would be nice to test this with, with a gravitational wave data. So uh, since I'm running out of time, let me keep this summer here and stop and take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Misha. We have time for a few questions. So what were the equations for matter and dark matter? Yes, yeah, so the equations for matter and dark matter basically fluid equations. And how do they couple? Is it, yeah? How do they couple? They couple through gravity. Just gravity. Basically. Just gravity, yeah. And so the initial conditions were Gaussian. What were the parameters for the Gaussian? Well, uh, the parameter is the initial, we assume that the initial conditions are adiabatic for all the components, uh -huh. uh, and they are characterized, let's say, by the initial gravitational potential produced during inflation. Uh -huh. I might ask a very quick question myself. Yes. So but when uh, in this last part of your discussion, mm -hmm. when you calculate this sort of Compton, let's say amplitude, uh, right. I guess you focus on the regime in which the frequency of the massless particle is comparable with the momentum transfer that it experiences, or do you have access also to regime in which the frequency is much larger than the momentum transfer, so which would be more an iconal regime? Right, yeah, that's a great question. So here basically we're in this, uh, uh, post minkowski regime where there are small parameter, well, effectively is this, is the Schwarzschild radius times the frequency. So we always assume that the frequency is small. Uh, you know, for the EFT kind of works only in this regime, but in JAR in, we have, um, you know, the full JAR results we in principle have all, also for, for a general frequency. Yeah, so it would be good to, but you see to match this, we need to go beyond this usual EFT a la Goldberger, Goldberger and Rothstein. Yeah, so I think that should be possible to match the canal regime as well. Frequency. Any further questions for Misha? Okay, if not, let's yeah. let's thank him again. Thank you.